Chapters fifty three and fifty four of Foul Play by Charles Reed and Dion Boucicault. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Fifty three. In that curious compound, the human heart, a respectable motive is sometimes connected with a criminal act. And so it was with Joseph Wiley. He had formed an attachment to Nancy Rouse, and her price was two thousand pounds. This Nancy Rouse was a character she was general rolleston's servant for many years her place was the kitchen but she was a woman of such restless activity and so wanting in the proper pride of a servant that she would help a housemaid or a lady's maid or do anything almost except be idle to use her own words she was one as couldn't abide to sit mum chance that fatal foe to domestic industry the london journal fluttered in vain down her area for she could not read she supported a sick mother out of her wages aided by a few presents of money and clothes from helen rolleston who had a great regard for nancy and knew what a hard fight she had to keep a sick woman out of her twenty pounds a year in love nancy was unfortunate her buxom looks and sterling virtues were balanced by a provoking sagacity and an irritating habit of speaking her mind she humbled her lover's vanity one after another and they fled her heart smarted more than once nancy was ambitious and her first rise in life took place as follows when the rollestons went to australia she had a good cry at parting with helen but there was no help for it she could not leave her mother however she told helen she could not stomach any other service and since she must be parted was resolved to better herself this phrase is sometimes drolly applied by servants because they throw independence into the scale in nancy's case it meant setting up as a washerwoman helen opened her hazel eyes with astonishment at this the first round in the ladder of nancy's ambition however she gave her ten pounds and thirty introductions twenty-five of which missed fire and with the odd five nancy set up her tub in the suburbs and by her industry geniality and frugality got on tolerably well in due course she rented a small house backed by a small green and advertised for a gentleman lodger she soon got one and soon got rid of him however she was never long without one nancy met joseph wiley in company and as sailors are brisk wooers he soon became her acknowledged suitor and made some inroad into her heart though she kept on the defensive warned by past experience wiley's love-making had a droll feature about it it was most of it carried on in the presence of three washerwomen because nancy had no time to spare from her work and wiley had no time to lose in his wooing being on shore for a limited period and this absence of superfluous delicacy on his part gave him an unfair advantage over the tallow chandler's foreman his only rival at present many a sly thrust and many a hearty laugh from his female auditors greeted his amorous eloquence but for all that they sided with him and nancy felt her importance and brightened along with her mates at the sailor's approach which was generally announced by a cheerful hail he was good company to use nancy's own phrase and she accepted him as a sweetheart on probation but when mr wiley urged her to marry him she demurred and gave a string of reasons all of which the sailor and his allies the subordinate washerwoman combated in full conclave then she spoke out my lad the wash-tub is a saddle as won't carry double i've seen poverty enough in my mother's house it shan't come in at my door to drive love out a window two comes together with just enough for two next year instead of two they are three and one of the three can't work and wants a servant extra and by and by there is half a dozen and the money coming in at the spigot and going out at the bunghole one day in the middle of his wooing she laid down her iron and said you come along with me and i wonder how much work will be done while my back is turned for you three gabbling and wondering whatever i'm a-going to do with this here sailor she took wiley a few yards down the street and showed him a large house with most of the windows broken there said she there's a sight for a seafaring man that's in chancery well it's better to be there than in hell said wiley meaning to be sharper wait till you've tried em both said nancy then she took him to the back of the house and showed him a large garden attached to it 
now joseph said she i've showed you a lodging-house and a drying-ground and i'm a cook and a clear starcher and i'm wild to keep lodgers and do for em washing and all then if their foul linen goes out they follows it the same if they has their meat from the cook-shop four hundred pounds a year lies there a-waiting for me i've been at them often to let me them premises but they says no we have got no order from the court to let which the court would rather see em go to rack and ruin for nothing than let em to an honest woman as would pay the rent punctual and make her penny out of em and nobody none the worse and to sell them the price is two thousand pounds and if i had it i'd give it this minute but where are the likes of you and me to get two thousand pounds but the lawyer he says miss rouse from you one thousand down and the rest on mortgage at forty-five pounds a year which is dirt cheap i say so now my man when that house is mine i'm yours i'm putting by for it o my side if you means all you say why not save a bit o yours once i get that house and garden you needn't go to see no more nor you shan't if i am going to be bothered with a man let me know where to put my finger on him at all hours and not lie shivering and shaking at every window as creaks and him out at sea and if you are too proud to drive the linen in a light cart why i could pay a man in short she told him plainly she would not marry till she was above the world and the road to the above world was through that great battered house and seedy garden in chancery now it may appear a strange coincidence that nancy's price to wiley was two thousand pounds and wiley's to wardlaw was two thousand pounds but the fact is it was a forced coincidence wiley bargaining with wardlaw stood out for two thousand pounds because that was the price of the house and garden and nancy now when wiley returned to england safe after his crime and his perils he comforted himself with the reflection that nancy would have her house and garden and he should have nancy but young wardlaw lay on his sick-bed his father was about to return to the office and the gold disguised as copper was ordered up to the cellars in fenchurch street there in all probability the contents would be examined ere long the fraud exposed and other unpleasant consequences might follow over and above the loss of the promised two thousand pounds wiley felt very disconsolate and went down to nancy rouse depressed in spirits to his surprise she received him with more affection than ever and reading his face in a moment told him not to fret it will be so in your way of life said his homely comforter your sort comes home empty-handed one day and money in both pockets the next i'm glad to see you home at all for i've been in care about you you're very welcome joe if you are come home honest and sober why that is the next best thing to coming home rich wiley hung his head and pondered these words and well he might for he had not come home either so sober or so honest as he went out but quite as poor however his elastic spirit soon revived in nancy's sunshine and he became more in love with her than ever but when presuming upon her affection he urged her to marry him and trust to providence she laughed in his face trust to him providence you mean said she no no joseph if you are unlucky i must be lucky before you and me can come together then wiley resolved to have his two thousand pounds at all risks he had one great advantage over a landsman who has committed a crime he could always go to sea and find employment first in one ship and then in another terra firma was not one of the necessaries of life to him he came to wardlaw's office to feel his way and talked guardedly to michael penfold about the loss of the proserpine his apparent object was to give information his real object was to gather it he learned that old wardlaw was very much occupied with fitting out a steamer that the forty chests of copper had actually come up from the shannon and were under their feet at that moment and that young wardlaw was desperately ill and never came to the office michael had not at that time learned the true cause of young wardlaw's illness yet while he detected that young wardlaw's continued absence from the office gave michael singular uneasiness 
the old man fidgeted and washed the air with his hands and with simple cunning urged wiley to go and see him about the proserpine and get him to the office if it was only for an hour or two tell him we are all sixes and sevens mr wiley all at sixes and sevens well said wiley affecting a desire to oblige give me a line to him for i've been twice and could never get in michael wrote an earnest line to say that wardlaw senior had been hitherto much occupied in fitting out the spring-bock but that he was going into the books next week what was to be done the note was received but arthur declined to see the bearer then wiley told the servant it was joseph wiley on a matter of life and death tell him i must stand on the staircase and halloo it out if he won't hear it any other way his threat obtained his admission to arthur wardlaw the sailor found him on a sofa in a darkened room pale and worn to a shadow mr wardlaw said wiley firmly you mustn't think i don't feel for you but sir we are gone too far to stop you and me there is two sides to this business it is one hundred fifty thousand pounds for you and two thousand pounds for me or it is what do i care for money now groaned wardlaw let it all go to the devil who tempted me to destroy her i loved better than money better than all the world well but hear me out said wiley i say it is one hundred fifty thousand pounds to you and two thousand pounds to me or else it is twenty years penal servitude to both on us penal servitude and the words roused the merchant from his lethargy like a shower-bath you know that well enough said wiley why twas a hanging matter a few years ago come come there are no two ways you must be a man or we are undone fear prevailed in that timorous breast which even love of money had failed to rouse wardlaw sat up staring wildly and asked wiley what he was to do first let me ring for a bottle of that old brandy of yours the brandy was got wiley induced him to drink a wine-glassful neat and then to sit at the table and examine the sailor's declaration and the logs i'm no great scholar said he i warn't a-goin to lay these before the underwriters till you had overhauled them there take another drop now twill do you good while i draw up this thundering blind thus encouraged and urged the broken-hearted schemer languidly compared the seaman's declaration with the logs and even in his feeble state of mind and body made an awkward discovery at once why they don't correspond said he what don't correspond your men's statement and the ship's log the men speak of one heavy gale after another in january and the pumps going but the log says a puff of wind from the northeast and here again the entry exposes your exaggeration one branch of our evidence contradicts the other this comes of trying to prove too much you must say the log was lost went down with the ship how can i cried wiley i have told too many i had got it safe at home why did you say that what madness why were you away from your office at such a time how can i know everything and do everything i counted on you for the head work ashore can't you think of any way to square the log to that part of our tale might paste in a leaf or two eh that would be discovered at once you have committed an irremediable error what broad strokes this hudson makes he must have written with the stump of a quill wiley received this last observation with a look of contempt for the mind that could put so trivial a question in so great an emergency are you quite sure poor hudson is dead asked wardlaw in a low voice dead don't i tell you i saw him die said wiley trembling all of a sudden he took a glass of brandy and sent it flying down his throat leave the paper with me said arthur languidly and tell penfold i'll crawl to the office to-morrow you can meet me there i shall see nobody else wiley called next day at the office and was received by penfold who had now learned the cause of arthur's grief 
and ushered the visitor into him with looks of benevolent concern arthur was seated like a lunatic pale and motionless on the table before him was a roast fowl and a salad which he had forgotten to eat his mind appeared to alternate between love and fraud for as soon as he saw wiley he gave himself a sort of shake and handed wiley the log and papers examine them they agree better with each other now wiley examined the log and started with surprise and superstitious terror why hiram's ghost has been here at work said he it is his very handwriting hush said wardlaw not so loud will it do the writing will do first-rate but any one can see this log has never been to see inspired by the other's ingenuity he then after a moment's reflection emptied the salt-cellar into a plate and poured a little water over it he wetted the leaves of the log with this salt water and dogs eared the whole book wardlaw sighed see what expedients we are driven to said he he then took a little soot from the chimney and mixed it with salad oil he applied some of this mixture to the parchment cover rubbed it off and by such manipulation gave it a certain mellow look as if it had been used by working hands wiley was armed with these materials and furnished with money to keep his sailors to their tail in case of their being examined arthur begged in his present affliction to be excused from going personally into the matter of the proserpine and said that penfold had the ship's log and the declaration of the survivors which the insurers could inspect previously to their being deposited at lloyd's the whole thing wore an excellent face and nobody found a peg to hang suspicion on so far after this preliminary and the deposit of the papers nothing was hurried the merchant absorbed in his grief seemed to be forgetting to ask for his money wiley remonstrated but arthur convinced him they were still on too ticklish ground to show any hurry without exciting suspicion and so passed two weary months during which wiley fell out of nancy rouse's good graces for idling about doing nothing be you a waiting for the plum to fall into your mouth young man said she the demand was made on the underwriters and arthur contrived that it should come from his father the firm was of excellent repute and had paid hundreds of insurances without a loss to the underwriters the proserpine had foundered at sea several lives had been lost and of the survivors one had since died owing to the hardships he had endured all this betokened a genuine calamity nevertheless one ray of suspicion rested on the case at first the captain of the proserpine had lost a great many ships and on the first announcement one or two were resolved to sift the matter on that ground alone but when five eye-witnesses suppressing all mention of the word drink declared that captain hudson had refused to leave the vessel and described as going down with the ship from an obstinate and too exalted sense of duty every chink was closed and to cut the matter short the insurance money was paid to the last shilling and benson one of the small underwriters ruined nancy rouse who worked for mrs benson lost eighteen shillings and sixpence and was dreadfully put out about it wiley heard her lamentations and grinned for now his two thousand pounds was as good as in his pocket he thought great was his consternation when arthur told him that every shilling of the money was forestalled and that the entire profit of the transaction was yet to come viz by the sale of the gold dust then sell it said wiley i dare not the affair must cool down before i can appear as a seller of gold and even then i must dribble it out with great caution thank heaven it is no longer in those cellars where is it then that is my secret you will get your two thousand all in good time and if it makes you one-tenth part as wretched as it has made me you will thank me for all these delays at last wiley lost all patience and began to show his teeth and then arthur wardlaw paid him his two thousand pounds in forty crisp notes he crammed them into a side pocket and went down triumphant to nancy rouse through her parlour window he saw the benign countenance of michael penfold he then remembered that penfold had told him some time before that he was going to lodge with her as soon as the present lodger should go this however rather interrupted wiley's design of walking in and chucking the two thousand pounds into nancy's lap 
on the contrary he shoved them deeper down in his pocket and resolved to see the old gentleman to bed and then produce his pelf and fix the wedding-day with nancy he came in and found her crying and penfold making weak efforts to console her the tea-things were on the table and nancy's cup half emptied wiley came in and said why what is the matter now he said this mighty cheerfully as one who carried the panacea for all ills in his pocket and a medicine peculiarly suited to nancy rouse's constitution but he had not quite fathomed her yet as soon as ever she saw him she wiped her eyes and asked him grimly what he wanted there while he stared at the reception but replied stoutly that it was pretty well known by this time what he wanted in that quarter well then said nancy want will be your master why did you never tell me miss helen was in that ship my sweet dear mistress as was that i feel for like a mother you left her to drown and saved your own great useless carcass and drowned she is poor dear get out of my sight do it wasn't my fault nancy said wiley earnestly i didn't know who she was and i advised her to come with us but she would go with that parson chap what parson chap what a liar you be she is wardlaw's sweetheart and don't care for no parsons if you didn't know you was to blame why didn't you tell me a word of your own accord you kept dark do you call yourself a man to leave my poor young lady to shift for herself she has had a good a chance to live as i had said wiley sullenly no she hadn't you to care yourself well since you are so fond of yourself keep yourself to yourself and don't come here no more after this i hate the sight on you you are like the black dog in my eyes and always will be poor dear miss helen ah i cried when she left my mind misgave me but little i thought she would perish in the salt seas and all for want of a man in the ship if you had gone out again after in the steamboat mr penfold have told me all about it i'd believe you weren't so much to blame but no lolloping and looking about all day for months there's my door joe wiley i can't cry comfortable before you as had a hand in drowning of her you and me is parted for ever i'll die as i am or i'll marry a man which you ain't one or nothing like one is he waiting for you to hold the door open mr penfold or don't i speak plainly enough them as i gave the sack afore you didn't want so much telling well i'm going said wiley sullenly then with considerable feeling this is hard lines but nancy was inexorable and turned him out with the two thousand pounds in his pocket he took the notes out of his pocket and flung them furiously down in the dirt then he did what everybody does under similar circumstances he picked them up again and pocketed them along with the other dirt they had gathered next day he went down to the docks and looked out for a ship he soon got one and signed a second mate she was to sail in a fortnight but before a week was out the banknotes had told so upon him that he was no longer game to go to sea but the captain he had signed with was a tartar and not to be trifled with he consulted a knowing friend and that friend advised him to disguise himself till the ship had sailed accordingly he rigged himself out with a long coat and a beard and spectacles and hid his sea slouch as well as he could and changed his lodgings finding that he succeeded so well he thought he might as well have the pleasure of looking at nancy rouse if he could not talk to her so he actually had the hardihood to take the parlour next door and by this means he heard her move about in her room and caught a sight of her at work on her little green and he was shrewd enough to observe she did not sing and whistle as she used to do the dog chuckled at that his banknotes worried him night and day he was afraid to put them in a bank afraid to take them about with him into his haunts afraid to leave them at home and out of this his perplexity arose some incidents worth relating in their proper order arthur wardlaw returned to business but he was a changed man all zest in the thing was gone his fraud set him above the world 
and that was now enough for him in whom ambition was dead and indeed nothing left alive in him but deep regrets he drew in the horns of speculation and went on in the old safe routine and to the restless activity that had jeopardized the firm succeeded a strange torpidity he wore black for helen and sorrowed with hope he felt he had offended heaven and had met his punishment in helen's death wardlaw senior retired to elm trees and seldom saw his son when they did meet the old man sometimes whispered hope but the whisper was faint and unheeded one day wardlaw senior came up express to communicate to arthur a letter from general rolleston written at valparaiso in this letter general rolleston deplored his unsuccessful search but said he was going westward upon the report of a dutch whaler who had seen an island reflected in the sky while sailing between juan fernandez and norfolk isle arthur only shook his head with a ghastly smile she is in heaven said he and i shall never see her again not here or hereafter wardlaw senior was shocked at this speech but he made no reply he pitied his son too much to criticize the expressions into which his bitter grief betrayed him he was old and had seen the triumphs of time over all things human sorrow included these however as yet had done nothing for arthur wardlaw at the end of six months his grief was as sombre and as deadly as the first week but one day as this pale figure in deep mourning sat at his table going listlessly and mechanically through the business of scraping money together for others to enjoy whose hearts unlike his might not be in the grave his father burst in upon him with a telegram in his hand and waved it over his head in triumph she is found she is found he roared read that and thrust the telegram into his hands those hands trembled and the languid voice rose into shrieks of astonishment and delight as arthur read the words we have got her alive and well shall be at charing cross hotel eight p m fifty four while the boat was going to the springbok general rolleston whispered to captain morland and what he said may be almost guessed from what occurred on board the steamer soon afterward helen was carried trembling into the cabin and the order was given to heave the anchor and get under way a groan of disappointment ran through the ship captain morland expressed the general's regret to the men and divided two hundred pounds upon the capstan and the groan ended in a cheer as for helen's condition that was at first mistaken for ill health she buried herself for two whole days in her cabin and from that place faint moans were heard now and then the sailors called her the sick lady heaven knows what she went through in that forty-eight hours she came upon deck at last in a strange state of mind and body restless strung up absorbed the rare vigour she had acquired on the island came out now with a vengeance she walked the deck with briskness and a pertinacity that awakened admiration in the crew at first but by and by superstitious awe for while the untiring feet went briskly to and fro over leagues and leagues of plank every day the great hazel eyes were turned inward and the mind absorbed with one idea skimmed the men and things about her listlessly she had a mission to fulfil and her whole nature was stringing itself up to do the work she walked so many miles a day partly from excitement partly with a deliberate resolve to cherish her health and strength i may want them both said she to clear robert penfold thought and high purpose shone through her so that after a while nobody dared trouble her much with commonplaces to her father she was always sweet and filial but sadly cold compared with what she had always been hitherto he was taking her body to england but her heart stayed behind upon that island he saw this and said it forgive me said she coldly and that was all her reply sometimes she had violent passions of weeping and then he would endeavour to console her but in vain they ran their course and were succeeded by the bodily activity and concentration of purpose they had interrupted for a little while at last after a rapid voyage they drew near the english coast and then general rolleston who had hitherto spared her feelings and been most indulgent and considerate felt it was high time to come to an understanding with her as to the course they should both pursue now helen said he 
about the ward laws helen gave a slight shudder but she said after a slight hesitation let me know your wishes oh mine are not to be too ungrateful to the father and not to deceive the son i will not be ungrateful to the father nor deceive the son said helen firmly the general kissed her on the brow and called her his brave girl but said he on the other hand it must not be published that you have been for eight months on an island alone with a convict anything sooner than that you know the malice of your own sex if one woman gets hold of that you will be an outcast from society helen blushed and trembled nobody need be told that but arthur and i am sure he loves me well enough not to injure me with the world but he would be justified in declining your hand after such a revelation quite and i hope he will decline it when he knows i love another however hopelessly you are going to tell arthur wardlaw all that i am then all i can say is you are not like other women i have been brought up by a man if i was arthur wardlaw it would be the last word you should ever speak to me if you were arthur wardlaw i should be on that dear island now well suppose his love should be greater than his spirit and if he does not go back when he hears of my hopeless love i don't see how i can i shall marry him and try with all my soul to love him i'll open every door in london to robert penfold except one my husband's and that door while i live he shall never enter oh my heart my heart she burst out sobbing desperately and her father laid her head upon his bosom and sighed deeply and asked himself how all this would end before they landed her fortitude seemed to return and of her own accord she begged her father to telegraph to the wardlaws would you not like a day to compose yourself and prepare for this trying interview said he i should but it is a mere weakness and i must cure myself of my weakness or i shall never clear robert penfold and then papa i think of you if old mr wardlaw heard you had been a day in town you might suffer in his good opinion we shall be in london at seven ask them at eight that will be one hour's respite god help me and strengthen poor arthur to bear the blow i bring him long before eight o'clock that day arthur wardlaw had passed from a state of sombre misery and remorse to one of joy exaltation and unmixed happiness he no longer regretted his crime nor the loss of the proserpine helen was alive and well and attributed not her danger but only her preservation to the wardlaws wardlaw senior kept his carriage in town and precisely at eight o'clock they drove up to the door of the hotel they followed the servant with bounding hearts and rushed into the room where the general and helen stood ready to receive them old wardlaw went to the general with both hands out and so the general met him and between these two it was almost an embrace arthur ran to helen with cries of joy and admiration and kissed her hands again and again and shed such genuine tears of joy over them that she trembled all over and was obliged to sit down he kneeled at her feet and still imprisoned one hand and mumbled it while she turned her head away and held her other hand before her face to hide its real expression which was a mixture of pity and repugnance but as her face was hidden and her eloquent body quivered and her hand was not withdrawn it seemed a sweet picture of feminine affection to those who had not the key at last she was relieved from a most embarrassing situation by old wardlaw he cried out on this monopoly and helen instantly darted out of her chair and went to him and put up her cheek to him which he kissed and then she thanked him warmly for his courage in not despairing of her life and his goodness in sending out a ship for her now the fact is she could not feel grateful but she knew she ought to be grateful and she was ashamed to show no feeling at all in return for so much so she was eloquent and the old gentleman was naturally very much pleased at first but he caught an expression of pain on arthur's face and then he stopped her my dear said he you ought to thank arthur not me it is his love for you which was the cause of my zeal if you owe me anything pay it to him for he deserves it best he nearly died for you my sweet girl 
no no you mustn't hang your head for that neither what a fool i am to revive old sorrows here we are the happiest four in england then he whispered to her be kind to poor arthur that is all i ask his very life depends on you helen obeyed this order and went slowly back to arthur she sat cold as ice on the sofa beside him and he made love to her she scarcely heard what he said she was asking herself how she could end this intolerable interview and escape her father's looks who knew the real state of her heart at last she rose and went and whispered to him my courage has failed me have pity on me and get me away it is the old man he kills me general rolleston took the hint and acted with more tact than one would have given him credit for he got up and rang the bell for tea then he said to helen you don't drink tea now and i see you are excited more than is good for you you had better go to bed yes papa said helen she took her candle and as she passed young wardlaw she told him in a low voice she would be glad to speak to him alone to-morrow at what hour said he eagerly when you like at one and so she retired leaving him in ecstasies this was the first downright assignation she had ever made with him they met at one o'clock he radiant as the sun and arose in his buttonhole she sad and sombre and with her very skin twitching at the thought of the explanation she had to go through he began with amorous commonplaces she stopped him gravely arthur said she you and i are alone now and i have a confession to make unfortunately i must cause you pain terrible pain oh my heart flinches at the wound i am going to give you but it is my fate either to wound you or to deceive you during this preamble arthur sat amazed rather than alarmed he did not interrupt her though she paused and would gladly have been interrupted since an interruption is an assistance in perplexities arthur we suffered great hardships on the boat and you would have lost me but for one person he saved my life again and again i saved his upon the island my constancy was subject to trials oh such trials so great an example of every manly virtue for ever before my eyes my gratitude and my pity eternally pleading england and you seemed gone for ever make excuses for me if you can arthur i i have formed an attachment in making this strange avowal she hung her head and blushed and the tears ran down her cheeks but we suspect they ran for him and not for arthur arthur turned deadly sick at this tremendous blow dealt with so soft a hand at last he gasped out if you marry him you will bury me no arthur said helen gently i could not marry him even if you were to permit me when you know more you will see that of us three unhappy ones you are the least unhappy but since this is so am i wrong to tell you the truth and leave you to decide whether our engagement ought to continue of course what i have owned to you releases you releases me but it does not unbind my heart from yours cried arthur in despair then his hysterical nature came out and he was so near fainting away that helen sprinkled water on his temples and applied eau de cologne to his nostrils and murmured poor poor arthur oh was i born only to afflict those i esteem he saw her with the tears of pity in her eyes and he caught her hand and said you were always the soul of honour keep faith with me and i will cure you of that unhappy attachment what do you hold me to my engagement after what i have told you cruel helen you know i have not the power to hold you i am not cruel and you have the power but oh think for your own sake not mine i have thought and this attachment to a man you cannot marry is a mere misfortune yours as well as mine give me your esteem until your love comes back and let our engagement continue it was for you to decide said helen coldly and you have decided there is one condition i must ask you to submit to i submit to it what 
before you hear it helen you don't know what a year of misery i have endured ever since the report came of your death my happiness is cruelly dashed now but still it is great happiness by comparison make your conditions you are my queen as well as my love and my life helen hesitated it shocked her delicacy to lower the man she had consented to marry oh helen said arthur anything but secrets between you and me go on as you have begun and let me know the worst at once can you be very generous arthur generous to him who has caused you so much pain i'll try said arthur with a groan i would not marry him unless you gave me up for i am your betrothed and you are true to me i could not marry him even if i were not pledged to you but it so happens i can do him one great service without injustice to you and this service i have vowed to do before i marry i shall keep that vow as i keep faith with you he has been driven from society by a foul slander that slander i am to sift and confute it will be long and difficult but i shall do it and you could help me if you chose but that i will not be so cruel to ask arthur bit his lip with jealous rage but he was naturally cunning and his cunning showed him there was at present but one road to helen's heart he quelled his torture as well as he could and resolved to take that road he reflected a moment and then he said if you succeed in that will you marry me next day i will upon my honour then i will help you arthur think what you say women have loved as unselfishly as this but no man that i ever heard of no man ever did love a woman as i love you yes i would rather help you though with a sore heart than hold aloof from you what have we to do together did i not tell you to clear his character of a foul stigma and restore him to england and to the world which he is so fitted to adorn yes yes said arthur but who is it why do i ask though he must be a stranger to me no stranger at all said helen but one who is almost as unjust to you as the world has been to him then fixing her eyes full on him she said arthur it is your old friend and tutor robert penfold End of chapters 53 and 54